Dr. Robert Byrne, IARC. Firstly, so why did IARC choose to review the research evidence on RF and mobile phones? Well, the IARC is the International Agency for Research on Cancer, part of WHO, the World Health Organization in Lyon, France. And the IARC has a long-standing program called the IARC Monographs, which uh, was initiated, in fact, in the 70s. And in that program, we look at all kinds of agents, chemical agents, biological agents, and also physical agents. And this recent evaluation was, in fact, the fourth in the series on physical agents. Uh, we had done before the um, monographs on ionizing radiation. Ten years ago, we have done the first one on non-ionizing radiation, which was the extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields. And this was just the fourth one. And we waited for the fixing of the date and finally we decided to do it this summer uh, because several important studies uh, had appeared in the literature on the use of mobile telephones which is one of the exposures to this type of radiation. Was it based on any particular concern that IARC had about the research and the quality of the research? Well we had um, an advice from an advisory group on priorities for uh, topics for the monographs to uh, to review in fact in the coming years and we have those advisory groups about every five years and the most recent advisory group already some three or four years ago said the exposure to radiation uh, in the radio frequency fields uh, is important to review because the first indications came up in the epidemiology that the use of mobile phones, first of all, it, was, it is very, very widespread, but also there were some indications that it may have a certain cancer hazard. And exposure and a suspicion of cancer are two main reasons to, to review an agent in the monographs. The classification, possibly carcinogenic, was chosen by IARC. Why that particular classification? Well, it was not chosen by IARC because, uh, of course, IARC does not uh, preempt the decision of the working group. We invite working, group, uh, working groups of, of international experts uh, with a reputation and a publication record in uh, the field to use that word this time, the field, the radio frequency uh, radiation. And it's for the working group to decide to weigh the evidence and then classify the evidence in one of the four or five categories that IARC has. Uh, a group one agent would be a carcinogen, where the causality between exposure and the cancer incidence has been established. Then we have a 2A, a probable carcinogen, a 2B, a possible carcinogen, and a group 3, non-classifiable. And that doesn't mean safe, but that means that there are just not enough data to draw a conclusion. So what does a, a 2B, possibly carcinogenic classification actually mean? That means in terms of the epidemiology that there are suggestions of an association between exposure to this type of radiation and the, an increased risk and increased incidence of cancer in humans, suggestion, but the studies are not complete, are not ideal, are not perfect, and there remain questions and doubts about the study designs, about the quality of the data. Uh, so there are all kinds of, of uh, um, sort of uh, doubts in, in, the, in terms of the quality of the data so that we say, or the working group decided to label it as a possible carcinogen. What other sorts of things have a, a, a 2B classification, a possibly carcinogenic classification? Well, two, uh, two examples that were um, uh, used in, in the media just after the evaluation of uh, the radiation from mobile telephones, which was in fact the radiation of the radio frequency fields in general, 
uh, a parallel was made with um, uh, pickled vegetables in in uh, and there is a classification of possible carcinogen of pickled vegetables Asian style. And that has something to do with uh, the chemical components in pickled vegetables, the amines, the nitrosamines, that are carcinogens in, uh, in humans and in other model systems. And also, uh, I must confess, the, the drinking of coffee is labeled as a possible carcinogen for, uh, for humans, uh, but that is based on other types of data. So a classification 2B does not mean that all the agents that are in 2B act in uh, exactly the same manner. What evidence did you consider to, to reach that conclusion? There have been so many research projects over recent years, mm -hmm. some given more credence than others. But what evidence did you consider to reach your conclusion? Well, the key evidence that the working group uh, reviewed and considered as uh, leading to its conclusion was in fact from two series of case control studies where one has looked at um, people who have uh, a certain type of brain cancer versus a group of people who do not have the cancer and then compared their sort of Tele mobile telephone behavior. So they looked at the intensity with which the group of patients and the group of controls used their mobile telephones. And that is the basis of the case control design. And those studies, um, the Interphone study was a large international study uh, that brought together the results from 13 different countries, where indeed a slight increase in uh, the incidence in, in the risk for glioma, a certain type of malignant brain tumor, was found in what was then defined as the highest category, the highest 10% of most intensive users of mobile telephones. In terms of the relationship that IARC has with the WHO, does the WHO take its lead from, from IARC in evaluating health risks from mobile technologies or are other sources of information also taken into account? No, with regards to the, the cancer data, the cancer hazard uh, identification, which is what IARC does in its uh, monographs program, um, the WHO makes rules and regulations and policies in terms of public health. Uh, and they rely on what IARC says uh, about the, the cancer aspect, because there are other health effects that the WHO covers, of course. But our mother organization in Geneva is in fact also the one that has the uh, competence and the remit to propose certain policies and behaviors. That's not what IARC does. IARC in principle does not make any recommendations of what should people do uh, with the evaluations. Given that you've had the opportunity to look closely at all the research in this field, do you think any more needs to be done on RF safety? The studies in the past have learned us where the flaws are. And it's, it's obvious that if you ask a person about his or her uh, telephone use, how many hours per day on average five years ago or ten years ago, no one will give you an exact answer. And later studies have looked at, at have asked in fact the telephone companies to look in the telephone bills of individual subscribers. And that has taken some, some persuasion because that was considered to be private information and uh, the telephone companies have been quite reluctant to give those data. But that would give the most exact measure of the exposure. And in many studies, exposure assessment is, is the big problem because you need to link the exposure to the effect. And if the exposure assessment is, is poor, then you never get uh, a clear picture of the association. Was there an absolute consensus in reaching IARC's classification of the, the 2B, possibly carcinogenic on, I, on RF? Well, there was a remarkable degree of consensus, and consensus does not mean unanimity, of course. 
but in the end, uh, virtually all the working group members uh, accepted the reasonable decision to classify this type of radiation in, in the category 2B. There were some who said the evidence from the epidemiology is, is inadequate, uh, should not be li considered limited, but uh, a step lower, uh, inadequate. But others said, well, no, we think that we can label it limited. And then, of course, there's a discussion and finally a decision made and uh, uh, virtually all the working group members, in, fa in fact, in the end, agreed with the 2B classification. Given you can compare the, um, the risk to using exposure to RF and mobile phones to uh, an equivalent of having too much Asian pickle or too much coffee, would that suggest to the layperson, in fact, that the risk of using mobile phone or exposure to RF is, in fact, a pretty low risk? Yeah, I, I think relatively it's low. Um, first of all, uh, cancers of the brain are rare. Uh, so even uh, an increase by 40%, which was about the increase that was found in those studies, uh, would mean in terms of numbers of victims, uh, well, a relatively small number, on relative to, to the, the, the millions of other people who have uh, much more prevalent cancers. On the other hand, of course, uh, where there is a hazard, uh, the measure should be taken to, to avoid uh, as much as possible the intensive uh, exposures. And there are a few, a few uh, uh, measures that are very simple to keep the telephone away from your body, to use it uh, more for texting, which is what the youngsters do because it's cheap, uh, and to, to uh, maybe limit, uh, in fact, uh, the use by small children. Given technology advances much more quickly in lots of ways than the scientific research has the capacity to accurately reflect the impact, do you think there's a chance that we won't really know the answers to the questions until it's quite possibly too late? It is possible, but it is also possible that the, the advances, uh, which I, I mentioned before, the advances in the technology, the development of the technique of uh, constructing a mobile telephone, which a uh, much lower energy output, uh, that that would, would um, uh, lead to a decreased exposure level of the, of the new generation of users. Uh, so that in the end, uh, the, the cancer effects would be so small that they become not measurable. And I think a cancer effect, if there is an effect but you cannot measure it, then it, it may become acceptable. How does the extent and quality of cancer research in the field of, of RF compare to research on other things, for example, that could cause cancer? Well, that's difficult to say. Uh, I, I mean, the, the, the key element in this type of research is to verify as precisely as possible uh, the exposure conditions uh, to link that with the outcome. Uh, I, would say, I, I would say it's, it's, it's not very difficult to, to measure, to see a cancer developing, but it's much more difficult to relate that to an exposure situation in the past, especially if the cancer takes 20 years to develop. And that has been uh, a problem in the study so far. And maybe what we learn from the quality and the flaws of the study so far uh, may lead to, for instance, prospective studies that one takes a generation of new users of the mobile telephone. One takes accurate records of their telephone bills and one follows them up for the next 10 or 15 years. And studies like that, uh, also among youngsters, are, are in the process of being, being initiated. And they may lead to the conclusion that with the modern telephones and the modified use, it is no longer a problem. Or it may be that the, the generation of the early year 2000s that 
that used this, this uh, old-fashioned type of mobile telephone with higher exposures, they may come out with, with uh, sort of a wave of, of uh, brain cancers in maybe the 10 years to come. There's also the broader RF exposure, though, as well, that seems to be developing very quickly. Mm -hmm. Is that a cause for concern? Well, that's relative because the, um, uh, we have proposed to the working group to look at environmental exposures from base station antennas, uh, radio and television towers, uh, the smart meters, which are now in discussion, uh, occupational exposure of people working professionally on uh, maintenance of radar installations and things like that. Uh, and the personal exposure, that is the, the mobile telephone against the ear. And there's a gradation, of course, in, in, the, in the exposure levels. And the working group has adopted that subdivision. And from the EPI studies in the environmental exposures, there have been no data, in fact, no solid data that contributed to the evaluation. And that is more or less logical also if you look at the exposure levels, because the exposure from a working telephone against the ear is uh, two or three orders of magnitude higher than from a base station across the street on the roof. Do you comfortably use a mobile phone yourself? I use it uh, not very often, but uh, yes, I'm, uh, I use it uh, comfortably. I'm not scared of the mobile telephone. And that's, of, of course, that, that we should not forget the enormous benefits of, of the mobile telephone, uh, especially also in, in developing countries developing countries who have in fact skipped the whole uh, situation of, of installing a fixed line system. They jumped from, from writing letters to using mobile telephones, so to speak. So it's, it has enormous benefits, of course. And are you a mobile phone user right up to the ear? Or are you a, a Bluetooth or are you a kind of a hands -free Well, the, the, it's good to, to, use, uh, to use the hands-free kits and to use it for texting and to reduce the, uh, uh, the duration of the conversation. And also, what, what my mother always said, it's better to listen than to speak. Because if you speak in a mobile telephone, it functions as an emitter. And it emits the signal to reach the base station, but it emits it also into your brain. And if you receive, if you hear the other side speak, then it it's just receives the, the, the small signal from the base station. So the, the energy emission is much less if you listen. And in a broader application for life, I suspect, as well. Um, many thanks to you, Dr. Barn. Great to speak okay. with you.